All right, so welcome everyone to this session that we're calling Intro to Self-Organization for Nonprofits. Let's make sure you're, you're in the right place with us this morning. I'm going to start with a territorial acknowledgement. So I'm calling in today from the unceded traditional territories of the Comox Nation on what is known as Vancouver Island in Canada. And we always love to know where everyone's feet are touching the ground. So if you would like to share in the chat, uh, I see some folks are already doing that. Um, but please do share where your feet are touching the ground today as well. Um, so my name is Jen Mayer, and I'm the executive director of New Stories. For those who are new to New Stories, um, our vision is for a life affirming and spiritual world that honors the interconnected nature of all beings. We're a charitable nonprofit. We're an intergenerational collective of teachers and facilitators working to co-create the conditions and build our collective capacity for a regenerative future. We use participatory storytelling, dialogue-based and regenerating community development approaches in our work. And just to kind of connect the threads between the territorial acknowledgement and our purpose and our reason for being here today, as a nonprofit, these structures that we're operating within were created so long ago where there were so many different assumptions about power, privilege, relationship, connection between people, connection between people and the land. So as we kind of are in these wild and uncertain times of global pandemic, of climate crisis, of great divisiveness, as well as great beauty, of course, there's always that as well. We're really asking how we can kind of reorient our work and create the, the conditions and the structure to enable us to really bring all of our gifts in service to these times that we're in. And I'm going to start now to pass it over to the rest of the team to introduce themselves and then we'll go through the agenda for our time together. Um, so, Christiana, how about you start? You'll have to unmute yourself. <clears throat> yeah, thanks a lot, Jen, and uh, hello to everybody. I am so excited um, and overjoyed, really. We've been talking about this for a while, and uh, now it's happening and it's real. And uh, just very briefly about myself. Um, I've been specialized in self-organization for over a decade now, um, after two decades in uh, business consulting and coaching and uh, realizing that something else is needed. And uh, in that capacity, I uh, met um, Heather at the Whitby Institute and Marnie, and we've been working together and uh, doing some programs there. And that's how I met. Jen and Bob, and here we are. I can't wait for what's going to emerge today. Thank you. Thank you, Christiana. Let's pass it to Heather. <laughs> you wanted Marty first? <laughs> no, that, it's always a desire to go uh, last because I love to pick up on every, everybody else's um, threads, right? <laughs> Um, uh, my name is Heather Johnson. I've been a part of the team of the Whidbey Institute for a little over 10 years. And this um, movement towards self-organization has been alive uh, really al almost this whole time of my uh, connection with the organization. And we've moved through so many waves of uh, the inquiry, evolution, uh, capacity to understand it, to live it, to make our mistakes, to learn, to grow. And so this moment being a possibility to be in the learning journey with with all of you share share what's what's alive and what's been supporting us, but also engage the you know the the, the questions, the the unknowns. So I'm just grateful actually to be able to be a part of the 
learning field right here. I'm going to hand over to Marnie. Thank you, Heather. My name is Marnie Jackson. I've been with the Whitby Institute almost eight years. And um, like Heather, I've enjoyed the, the ups and downs and the fast and the slow and the, uh, the ever onward pace of change with the organization in our relationship to how we do what we do. So the organization is um, almost 50 years old. It was founded in 1972, and it has always been um, a home for transformation. And the question we've been holding really intentionally lately is transformation from what to what. And so one of the great um, valuable lessons and gifts of self-organizing is that it is bringing how we do what we do into integrity with our mission and purpose in the world. So I'm just delighted to be here with you and um, to be a co-learner with Christiana and Jen and Heather. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and Zolma, can you introduce yourself as well? So we have Zolma here who is going to give her uh, beautiful, share her skills of deep listening um, and turning uh, what we talk about into some graphics. Hi, thanks. Thanks to the team. I'm very excited about this session. I was almost going to be mad at Jen for not inviting me, but she did <laughs> last minute. So, uh, so I'm delighted to be here and I hope that my listening and my drawing um, can be of service to our common understanding and, and curiosity. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Thank you so much for coming, Zoma. And it was uh, not intentional, the last minute invite. It's just my own uh, organizing abilities coming through. So um, what we're going to do is we're actually going to start um, by sending you off in small groups um, with uh, a question around self-organization. Um, and, and this is kind of to learn a little bit about what we collectively think we know about self-organization as a starting point for this learning journey together. Um, and then we'll come back into this main room and dive into that a little bit. And then Christiana is going to lead us um, into her knowledge and wisdom. And then Heather and Marnie will share their lived experience, um, their, their journey. And then we'll send you off into small groups again, just to kind of let all of that story sharing settle in and make sense of it a little bit and gather your questions. Um, and then we'll come back and you'll have the opportunity to ask, ask questions of Christiana and Marnie and, and um, Heather. And that will be the end of our time together. So that's our plan. The, the first thing we'll do is send you off into breakout rooms for, for those who haven't had this experience before. Um, you're just going to disappear from this main room and you will arrive in a new room with a small number of other people. I think we'll mostly be in groups of three. There may also be um, a couple of groups of four. Um, and there will be a little countdown clock up in the top right hand corner that will tell you how much time you have. We're going to give you 10 minutes for this one. And what we're going to ask you to do is to introduce yourself and to share why you were drawn to this conversation and to share what you think self-organization is. So you'll have about three minutes each to do all of that. And then you'll automatically, actually you'll get a little reminder saying there's one minute left and then you'll be zoomed back into this main room. So there might be a little bit of shuffling around, um, but for the most part, you should just arrive in a new room. And I've put those questions into the chat for you. And I think with that, I'm going to send you all off.
you need to stop the recording. There we go. Welcome back, everyone. So we'd love to hear from a few people of what you noticed with those questions. What did you learn or what did you notice? And we can have one or two people share with their voices and we would love for others to share in the chat. Anyone brave enough to share? What was the same or what was different in what people thought self-organization was? I'll start. I thought the questions were good. They led us into um, a discussion that showed some diverse viewpoints, um, but not necessarily viewpoints that couldn't be integrated. I found it pretty rich um, to hear the different perspectives and already, you know, feel like it's worth my time to get up at 6 a.m. Um, to participate in this. Wonderful, thank you, Robin. Anyone else? The chat is there as well, if you're not wanting to share with your voice. Okay, I'll go. Um, the, people had different ways of expressing it, but I think um, the why of why we would even consider this has to do with sustainability. And it could be about people sustainability so that just not a few would be burned out, you know, or carrying the load, or it could be sustainability about capital and other resources. So it just encompasses a whole way and say, is there a better way? And uh, the memorable line shared by one person was that we're a 501c3, but, three, but uh, we behave like a for-profit, you know, why do we be, do mm -hmm. business like that? So that was was were, were kind of the interesting comments made for me. And I think what binds us in this similar is, is this question about people, resources, sustainability. There's gotta be a better way. Beautiful, thank you. And Shoni shared in the chat so much curiosity and desire to allow our organizational structures to reflect our values and be in an alignment with the work that we're doing, yeah. And um, also like folks really not knowing what self-organization is. Yeah. And it, it feels like it could be so many different things. That's great. And we would one more person like to share with their voice and then we'll pass it to, to Christiana. Hi, Jen, this is Luann. Nice, nice to, to see, see you, Luann. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we actually talk so much about self-organization as we did. Uh, we the, we talked about collaboration. So there's a lot about collaboration, collaboration for the good of the whole versus the good of just survival. Um, so there was something about that and self capital S organization versus self small s, um, you know, conscious self-organization and just survival uh, self-organization as well. So there's a couple yeah. things that we just, but actually the finding each other is always the, the treasure in these calls is the, the finding the gems of the people on this call and how we gel and, and our similarities and interests. So thank you. This call is always worthwhile. Beautiful, thank you so much for coming, Luan. And thanks for sharing those insights. So some, some wonderful questions and themes there, Christiana. So let's pass it to you to lead us into some of what you've been learning. Unmute. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. I've been uh, really uh, excited to read everything uh, in the chat and whilst at the same time listening to what you were saying. And uh, I, uh, I'm going to be the one to be sharing more about right now. So we'll do PowerPoint um, and uh, 
uh, be talking about self-organization and uh, connected issues. Um, really very much from the perspective to introduce what we're going to talk about in the actual three times uh, two hour sessions. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to be very transparent. I hope we're going to manage to pique your interest so much that if you haven't already, you're going to this just say, where we are going to do a really uh, deep dive together on the issue. So uh, in the preparation, we had this conversation about talking about and talking from. And um, so this is like, I'm going to be the one at first to be talking about, and then um, Heather and Marnie are going to be talking more from their experience. And then hopefully in the Q and A's, <clears throat> we will all be speaking from the experience and being able to answer your questions from there. So let me start sharing my screen. Um, Self-organization uh, for nonprofits. So let me start by asking uh, the question of why self-organization? Why are we at all talking about? Number one, I got three reasons and I'm sure there's many more. So what is our 21st century reality? We're faced with speed as never before. We're becoming more and more aware of complexity. Not that, I mean, we probably are creating more complexity, but we are becoming more and more aware of complexity that already is. To look at things from a systemic view, to see how things are completely connected, how everything is connected. Thankfully, that is a consciousness that is emerging more and more. And technology and the development of technology is like, like a driver who is just speeding up ever more, even more, even more complexity. And of course, with a globalized world, we are at that speed with that complexity facing tremendous global issues. And uh, the corona pandemic is only, I mean, it is actually really the first time that we are physically feeling the connectedness, the global connectedness, that things are global at the moment. And because of that speed connect, um, complexity and, and uh, the, the, the global issues, the need for social change and for social innovation are, is, is exploding at an exponential uh, rate. And um, of course, the nonprofits are doing as best they can to deal with ever more uh, social issues and, um, and environmental issues and all the other global issues that we have um, while dealing with this incredible speed and the complexity. And now we have number two. We are organized, I would say probably most uh, organizations in the conventional management hierarchy, the power hierarchy. The power hierarchy was invented by, we were, most of us probably know, Frederick Taylor over a hundred years ago in his book, Scientific Management. And the fundamental principles are the same today. Over the last 50 years, we've been trying to invent ever more trainings and uh, uh, all sorts of support tools to make the power hierarchy better. The fact is it's not getting better. It is always, it is a, probably we could say a dinosaur that is a hundred years old and present in a world that is completely different than a hundred years ago. So that brings us to number three, the, organiz the organizational structures <clears throat> of our nonprofit organizations. Number one, are rooted in these hundred and over hundred year old organizational concept, concept, uh, concepts. And at the same time, in completely overaged legal structures, which are, which are actually holding us in those old concepts. But the social issues that we're dealing with today are so much from today. And that is a, um, a tension and a mismatch that, is, uh, that we're sensing in practically every organization and in the symptoms that people who are working in organizations are showing. And that has been showing up in a lot of um, research. So 
Why self-organization? Because self-organization nourishes the condition for purpose-guided organizations to function in a way that lets people and organization thrive whilst it is serving, whilst they are serving the organization's purpose and the structure as well. So it is about nourishing the conditions. And uh, we, we know, we talk about self-organization and many of you have said, we don't really know what self-organization is. There is since uh, probably the seventies, um, there are initiatives, uh, some organizations who have tried to work in a self-organized way. And in the last decade, there's been an, in, an explosion of um, all different answers to the question what self-organization is. And um, so we know there is never, a, it's never a question of right or wrong. Um, for me, it is always a question of what is useful. And uh, from working with different forms of, of what is called self-organization or self-organized systems and exploring that field uh, also from a perspective from from a perspective of what is what can serve the greater whole, um, I have come to a definition of self-organization and that has nothing to do with it primarily has nothing to do with the way we organize, but what are the roots? Where does self-organization actually come from? And self-organization is the evolutionary principle of the universe, of nature. Some of, I, I, I read a comment um, that it's about uh, uh, a picture of bio of, the, of, the, of, uh, of organic um, development, yes. So the evolutionary principle of nature and the universe as a whole. This is how we hold self-organization. And that means if we follow self-organizing principles, that means that we try to align and tune into the evolutionary development of the greater whole. To me, this is a really important uh, a important way of looking at self-organization because it is not just about the way how we structure our organizations. Yes, it is that too, but it is a question of what is needed to be able to serve the greater whole and to be able to serve the greater whole, we need to understand the connectedness of everything. And that means in the way we look at our organizations, we need to understand how we can remain connected um, or how can we live that connectedness with the greater whole? And so since the Big Bang, the universe has developed in a self-organized way. So it is not only the evolutionary principle of the universe, it is also the oldest universe that exists. Uh, sorry, the oldest principle that exists. So when we talk about self-organizing a company, and that is the same whether it's a nonprofit or a profit, Self-organizing a company means we are mirroring those evolutionary principles or we are finding, we are searching answers of how to mirror those evolutionary principles in the governance, the operations and in the social dynamics of our organizations. And this is the way how we understand self-organization. So- Christiana? Christiana? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, see, we're just in our final minute. I'm just giving you your time oh check. Okay, then I'm going to have to really speed up. <laughs> so manifesting the principles of, uh, if we manifest those principles of self-organization in the way we do our work in the world, that means we have to completely unlearn and learn new the foundational principles, how organization works, if we are in service on purpose. And we've had this short conversation before we started. That means we need to change our relationship to power. And if we change our relationship to power, this brings us into a, um, it, it challenges our belief systems and it challenges how we understand um, how things should be working in all contexts of our life. We have grown up to look at um, 
at power in a hierarchical way. And um, it, it, that is rooted so deep. But if we go into working in a self-organized way, in a, which is a, total, a completely different way of collaboration, of co-creation, of collective intelligence, we really, these are words that sound very nice, but to actually live them challenges us in our core belief system. And therefore, and that is the second part of our uh, three-part series, we look at what does that actually mean for the personal uh, development uh, journey that we go on. And there are four core capacities that we need to be able to thrive um, in a self-organized context. And um, so we're going to talk about, in our sessions, we're going to talk about the capacity to differentiate, um, transcend, and then integrate. We're going to talk about uh, alignment, consciousness about personal purpose in alignment with organizational purpose. We're going to talk about self-realization, so becoming ever more of who we truly are, because in a self-organized system, we need to live and bring ourselves fully as who we are um, into our uh, relations, into our collaborations, and last but not least, inner leadership, which is a question of being present in the moment, being able to sense into what is needed now and next. And then there are a number of important differentiations, and those differentiations are crucial to self-organization. We need to differentiate power and authority, personal purpose and organizational purpose, self-realization and organizational evolution. Those are parallel running, they influence each other, but we need to be able to look at them differentiated. And then inner leadership and systemic leadership. What, what is leadership when we have a system of distributed authority and we distribute every uh, decision-making, we distribute purpose. So those are the, 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 the issues that we're going to talk about. And then in the last session, we're going to see how does that work out in structure and in the way we organize and govern. And that means we, are, we, we take a new perspective on, on the differentiation of organizational dynamics and social dynamics. And the, this, the clarification of that helps us to untangle um, uh, something that has been confused and so while on the one side, we're talking about structures, mirroring organic structure, this is not no hierarchy. This is just an organic hierarchy with its completely different dynamics. And on the other side, the culture and the social dynamics, values, norms, and everything that belongs along to it. And this is the way you can actually begin uh, self-organizing dynamics on a larger scale. And being able to do that, again, we need to support the personal learning and the personal development um, that to integrate those distinctions and then to actually live them. If we don't learn that self-organization is, I have not seen an organization that can really fully live and the people in it that can full, uh, fully live self-organization without integrating that distinction. But of course, if you make that distinction, you have to bring those two parts into symbiosis. And uh, so symbiosis being one of the major drivers of evolutionary change, we have to bring those two systems, the organizational system with its own dynamics and the social system with its own dynamics into symbiosis to function together to the advantage of both, which is what we see a lot in nature. And the answer of how to do that is what we call the symbiotic enterprise, which is what Heather and Marnie also will be talking about. The thing is that if we have an organized, self-organized structure, but we have legal, um, a legal context that does not understand what self-organization is, we need something that builds a bridge between the self-organized our self-organized uh, world and the not self-organized or non-self-organized context that we are embedded in. And that is how we, 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 we have an answer for that through what we call the enterprise uh, context. And uh, that was it for now. Thank you, Jen. I'm gonna stop uh, screen sharing. Thank you so much, Christiana. That's a lot to take in. <laughs>
So um, we'll shift into um, kind of landing the theory in practice and story. So Heather and Marnie are just going to share a bit of their experience of living self-organization at the Whidbey Institute. Um, and then we'll send you off to kind of let it all sink in and make sense of it. So um, I'm not sure which of you would like to go first, Heather or Marnie. I'll let you unmute and decide. Heather, I'm wondering if you'd like to um, to start us off. Yeah, with the sort of the the why, what what drove us into our our sort of mad self experiment, right? <laughs> um, you know, I um, there's maybe three very simple things. One is integrity, and uh, the pain that happens when there's a gap between our stated purpose, what we're about, and our structures and our culture and how we're living it. And that pain, that pain, rather than being something that's terrible or wrong that has to be gotten rid of, that pain is feedback. And so that would be sort of one piece I'll share a little bit about. Another is this, um, as we've been in this experiment over these 10 years, um, the assumption I've most encountered that has uh, really, um, presented barriers for moving forward is the, um, the assumption from our society, from this, the sort of stories we're embedded in, that if you don't have hierarchy, you must have flat organization. And for lots of folks having experimented over these decades in flat organizational models, um, the resistance of, of, you know, that comes from the assumptions, oh, um, flat organization, we've tried this, it doesn't work. And so how do we do this more benevolently? There's a dance between these two worldviews. And this conversation is really um, a conversation about how, rather than this, um, this or this, it's, it's really examining what's embedded in this and what's embedded in this and how do we learn from both the best of, of all of this and how do, we, how do we nurture structures that support the kind of cultural well-being. So in this, there's a conflation of power and hierarchy. So power and people. And then the assumption here is, well, we've got to get rid of hierarchy. We've got to get rid of this power dominance. And, um, but what this frequently does is take away the kind of structure and agreements and clarity between people and sort of leave open this sense of like, oh, well, we'll figure it out because we love each other and we're in relationship. And what's provided here, sort of a third, <laughs> third axis is really recognizing that it's not about taking structure away um, and, it's, and it's not about just counting on benevolence, is how do we design a structure that is, um, um, that has clarity. Um, you know, and Jenna is so appreciated in one of our earlier conversations, you're lifting up clarity as kindness. You know, and that, that it's about providing clarity and it's about um, providing a structure shifting from a sense of hierarchy being bad to it's not about hierarchy itself. Nature is hierarchy, it's holearchies, but differentiating the power from, from, the, from the hierarchy structure. And so getting past that assumption, that knee-jerk assumption of if you're not doing this, it must be this has been, has been a significant challenge. So to be able to be in this conversation and then the real, I mean, the, the, that this is such a deep paradigm shift that um, the depth of healing, um, if we do look at the roots of, in the United States, the nonprofit 501c3 context, it is an expression of white supremacy. It is an expression of these roots of a place where, um, you know, predominantly white women were provided an access to a sense of power and contribution to fill holes in our society and needs, um, parented by uh, a board and controlled by donors. That's a very crass way of, of framing it. And yet when I, um, along the journey, uh, sat down and in a conversation about, you know, there's a parallel in this work and moving through anti-racism work. This is, this is about this healing through what this power dominance has done in our societies and of our organizations are about this deeper healing, are about how do we truly you know, nurture conditions for health and stop harm how do we bring our structures and our systems in alignment in a way that supports our culture? So then go back to the first point, the pain. You know, so many of us I know experience it personally. The consequences, the symptoms, the outcomes feel like failure. They feel like, oh, we're just, we, our organization is struggling with these dynamics and how do we fix it? 
And that fixing mindset is also part of this old paradigm. How do we not as a machine try to fix ourselves, but how do we nurture these conditions for health? And that's what for me is um, calls forward when it gets difficult, when it gets challenging, just keeps calling us forward. So over to you, Marnie. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, I, I so appreciate the distinction between a hierarchy of, of titles or power or personality versus a hierarchy of function. Um, and what I've appreciated in our self-organizing system is that there are certainly um, things that take precedence. There are certainly roles that have authority um, over certain functions, but it's not about you know, who the most charismatic or the most um, educated or the most dominant person in the system is. It's about what is the, the best way to bring clarity to our shared working agreements towards a collective purpose. And so the hierarchy doesn't go away. It's just supplanted by a hierarchy of function as opposed to a hierarchy of power or personality. And I know that um, we need to stay on target with our time. And so I'm going to rush through some points that just feel so important to mention. You're, you're okay for time, Marnie. I'm okay for time. Okay, great. I just think Thank there's you. so much to say. Um, one of the greatest gifts of, of being on this journey has been the support we've received. So as a member of the Whitby Institute team, I just can't thank Christiana enough for the way she's been a mentor and teacher. Um, the folks who've been on this journey and can share not only um, lessons learned so that we don't have to repeat the mistakes, but also sometimes just that sense of that's a natural, that's a natural stepping stone. Don't worry, you'll get through this, you know, because it is a matter of relearning uh, decades of socialization. Many of us have been socialized since very early childhood into hierarchical systems of power over. It takes practice and intentionality and good humor to unlearn these habits, to be patient with ourselves and one another in learning sometimes what feels like entirely new ways of being but they are also deeply intuitive and human ways of being. And so I'm reminded of a conversation I had um, with a, a wonderful mentor friend, Ann Stadler, who's in the Whitby Institute's community about play and how as children, we might just go out into the forest and co-create something. We might create a village or a imaginary world and um, we just all fall into doing what we're great at and innovating and suggesting and guiding and leading and following. And so some of that, that sort of natural human um, ingenuity for collaboration can come forward when you have the clarity of agreements that allows each person to really shine. I so appreciate the importance of, of clarity. Um, one of the words I often shy away from now is we. I love to say we. We should. We should do this. We should do that. We should have this. We should have that. And now in self-organizing context, I just am always reminded to ask who is we? And is it pointing to a missing role, a missing accountability? Is there a point of clarity that we can arrive at so that I feel fully personally authorized to be the person who takes that step? Or that I can look to a colleague and say, your role can take that step. And, uh, and I'll also just point to collaboration. This system of clarifying what, what work is which roles to do it doesn't supplant collaboration. It doesn't mean you don't engage stakeholders, you don't get relevant perspectives. Advice seeking is very welcome and necessary in self-organizing, but it doesn't um, need to be conflated with consensus seeking. And so to move out of that habitual consensus seeking that is so often prevalent in nonprofits, where um, ultimately perspectives are integrated, advice is reconciled, um, and movement is made uh, based on which role has authority to move forward and um, what other roles, what other relevant roles have been consulted. And then of course, this constant uh, recognition of the value of feedback. So we are always on this journey to sense what is true, what is needed, respond accordingly. Like a biological organism, we we don't um, project five years into the future and then stay on a rigid course towards that vision. We don't try to predict and control our outcomes, but we are, um, we are nimble, agile, responsive, and it just brings an element of a dance to our shared work. 
I also want to just acknowledge what Christiana shared around how having our belief system challenged really sets us off on a journey of personal development. And there's no understating the importance of this internal capacity development. Um, I've found in our system at the Whidbey Institute that each and every person in the self-organizing system really needs to be able to reflect on themselves, to intentionally develop their capacities, um, to process their own tensions, to differentiate and integrate their personal and professional perspectives. And I just want to acknowledge that personally, it's been such a tremendous gift to participate in uh, a course that Christiana offered the language of spaces coach certification several years ago. The language of spaces framework um, for differentiation and integration is one that if you haven't learned about it, I invite you to learn about it, whether that's through participating in Christiana, I'd love to hear if we're going to be touching on that in the upcoming deep dive sessions, but um, one way or another, this language of spaces framework has been so vital in getting my head wrapped around concepts that um, really need to be engaged with directly and intentionally before they can start to feel intuitive and smooth, but um, once they're they're under your belt, so to speak. These capacities really support all of our ways of working together. And it's about this power shift from shifting from looking to the person in power to provide that sort of parental guidance or permission or direction to um, sensing one, one's own internal power to help uh, contribute to shared outcomes that are deeply aligned with the organization's purpose and one's personal um, capacities, skills, gifts, and longings. So I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, all, all three of you. That's, um, there are just so many different pieces. It's, I, for me, I'm really excited. And also like my brain is hurting a little bit. <laughs> trying to make sense of some of the concepts and so that is a lot of information uh, that we just shared and we'd like you to give you an opportunity uh, to make sense of it a little bit uh, so we're going to send you off again into new uh, small groups with an invitation, uh, here's the questions that we're offering, but we really invite you just to have a conversation and um, what is standing out for you from what has been shared? What is surprising you? What else would you like to know or what else do you feel you need to know? We'll send you off for 10 minutes and when we come back, you'll have an opportunity to share a little bit about kind of what is standing out for you and also to ask questions. And we'll, we'll spend um, a good chunk of time just in, in that, that kind of Q&A space. And then we'll visit Zoma to see how, how she's able to reflect this journey that we've been in together uh, back to us through her art. And then we'll close for the day. So here we go. Um, enjoy your sense-making time. There we go. All right, yeah, so so questions in the chat or raise your hand and we'll do our best to get, get everybody's voices into the room here. You need questions or comments. I'll go. Excellent, thanks, Linnea. Um, well, in our first breakout, I was saying how confusing the, um, like, I just really have a clue. 
about what you're really talking about. And um, I was really, really uh, moved, Christiane, by uh, when you connected it to evolutionary, uh, um, the principles of evolution, suddenly I get what you're talking about. Uh, and that's really, really helpful. And um, I've often referred to new stories and the work we're trying to do as um, biomimicry at the level of story. And I'm starting to understand that what you're talking about is biomimicry at the level of organization, um, which makes it much easier for me to grok uh, what's trying to happen here. Because there's something about self, self-organizing as a term that makes it sound like nobody's in charge and it's chaos. Um, so uh, I really appreciate putting it in an evolutionary uh, context because that's what we're trying to do at New Stories. Thank you. And for those who might not know, Linnea is our board chair uh, at New Stories. And, and we have um, Bob Stilger is here as well, who I'm sure many of you know, and he's the founder. Thanks for waving there, Bob. Stacy, go ahead. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I am completely thrilled with everything that I am hearing today. And in it sort of intuitively, I feel like I understand this, although you're naming, <clears throat> excuse me, you're naming some language and the way you frame things um, just a little bit different, like beyond my edge of awareness. But to me, I have been leaning in toward embodiment practice for my entire adult life. And when I leaned in 30 years ago to an exploration in uh, somatic movement and, and transformational process through soma, I learned about the microcosm, the ecological landscape within. When I 30 years later shifted into nature connection work, I learned that everything that I had been doing on the inside was also now being explored externally. And as a leader of a nature connection organization, I completely understand this micro macro relationship. And now you are speaking about it at the organization level and at the leadership level and at the transformational level in terms of systems that can influence how we function in societies. And it just, there's a continuum here that just resonates so much with me. Christiana, I just thank you so much for that. And I really appreciate too, the nature of this work as being anti-racist decolonization work and moving towards systems of integration and, um, and recognizing, yeah, I, I kind of heard an, when we popped back in to the main room, you were speaking about, I heard two words, nature, and love, and I completely relate. And thank you for naming that. I don't know what context you were talking about, but I get it. So I am wanting to learn more. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Christiana, did you wanna, you wanted to share some things, I think. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Stacy, And I just wanted to say that uh, a very big part of my learning was through the embodiment work with Arawana Hayashi from the Presencing Institute. And I've been wanting to, uh, to create a program about an embodied experience of self-organization because only if we allow the actual true emergence out of our body will we be able to live what we're talking about here. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. Thank you. Judy has written a question. Um, uh, I'm wondering where I could find more in the inherent racism and white supremacy is found foundational to nonprofits. And Heather or Marnie, I'm wondering if you can speak to that. <clears throat> the first conversation um, was actually with the People's Institute. It was in uh, addressing institutionalized racism where it was brought up as a, a seed of an idea uh, and an understanding. And then um, I'd be happy to um, find some links to be able to share with the group afterwards in the follow-up and follow-up material. Yeah, I can think of um, three or four articles and um, several sort of 
matrices that have been incredibly informative for me and for us at the Whitby Institute. So to create a set of follow-up resources on that topic, would I'd love to participate in that. And I so appreciate the question. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, it's a great question. And I also just really want to acknowledge like that is definitely a uh, I use this analogy a lot, but we're, we're learning as we go on that front, hey, because we've been swimming in this water for so long. So it's great to um, kind of ground in some of the thinking that's come before us. And I just really want to acknowledge that we're, we're learning as we go and we have a, a lot of work to do on that front. Um, Bill. Yeah, Hi. <laughs> so actually my group tools for change tools for change.org does a lot of work on training around um, racism from the um, subjective side of power so the intersection between institutional and personal um, transformation around racism so there's some free resources on that website tools for change.org yeah um, so I think one of the challenges in doing this work is to recognize that as coming from mainly white um, power structures and having all this set of assumptions about the world, um, we really need to learn from folks like from the People's Institute and other organizations that are led by people of color, if not exclusively folk, uh, BIPOC folks. Um, So the assumption that self is the most important place to start, for example, doesn't resonate with um, people from different cultures that I'm connected to, um, to prioritize the self over the ancestors or um, community or um, collective organization. So when we start to talk about this stuff, it, as you were saying, Jen, it's a, a real learning process. I just wanted to put that out. And just because we start down the road of anti-racism and decolonial, it's, um, it's deep work. A question, I love the frame. I really appreciate what you all have been going through um, watching the Institute over the years. And Christiane, I hadn't heard of you before, but the work is really powerful for me. Um, in our small group, we talked about where does it start? Do you start from the board and executive leadership, if you will, if you're in an organization like that, or does it start from a revolt from below, if you will? Um, and what, how does um, how does the um, initiation process, even before the training process, happen? Uh, that's, and I know there's probably lots of different ways. Thank you so much for, for all that you shared there, Bill. Christiana, would you like to speak to that question first? Yeah, I would like to, and then please maybe um, Heather and Marnie bring in your perspective. I think um, there's the question is, is there an ideal answer or is there a real answer? <laughs> so I think, um, the ideal answer would be there is a sense in the system, sort of a shared sense that we want to do our work together in a different way to feel more connected to what we are doing, what, what the, the outcome, um, who we are doing it for and find a better way to sense connection um, with each other and with everything. So I do, I do agree with you, self-organization and, um, uh, the assumption of starting with self, it's a question of seeing that there is never either or, there's always all in it um, that I think is really important. So I really resonated with what you said there. Um, <clears throat> the question for the, uh, okay, I'm not answering your question. I'm going into what you said first. So st let me stay with your question. Um, ideally, it is a sort of a, sen a shared sense. Um, the reality normally is that somebody learns about it and then brings the conversation in. If the board's not on board, um, it's not gonna work. I think that's what I can say. Yeah, I wanna um, lift up one of the paradoxes. <laughs> um, you know, as far as 
ways that this started in our context at the, with the Institute, um, definitely that shared sensing and then um, being able to see other organizations, other models. Um, we have chosen to um, uh, engage holacracy as an operational structure. This isn't about holacracy, but we engaged it. There are other models, sociocracy and others. Um, but it was being able to see the, the learning that was happening in other spaces that was able to move the work forward. And the paradox, so um, when we were really taking steps forward, um, I had written a paper, sort of a proposal to the organization. If we're about what we're about, we need an organizational model that aligns. And that was in March of 2014. And I received a pre-published version, a PDF version of um, Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Lelou in April of 2014. So the timing was really helpful. <laughs> and what reinventing organizations was, um, I experienced it as a collection of case studies um, from different organizations of different scales, different structures, different legal frames, different um, uh, languages, different contexts, who unbeknownst to each other were de developing similar practices around self-management. So shifting it from a conversation about one modality, one approach, one implementation to this is an emerging emerging expression of how we be and do together with greater health. So so long as we're connected, I think with the principles over the particular application, there's greater possibility for health. And the paradox being that that Lelou, Frederick Lelou and reinventing organizations named was because we are embedded in the systems that we're embedded in, it paradoxically requires those who are holding power to invest that power into the self-organizing system and use that power to protect it. Because, because there is this, you know, um, it's really about how do we make the most space for self-organization to have an idea that we can do self-organization um, and not be impacted or sort of um, shifted by, you know, the, the legal requirements that we're embedded in and the cultural expectations. Um, embracing that paradox the power needs to be invested in and used to protect and paradoxically also released into the self-organizing system. Thank you, Heather. And Pam, you put your hand down. Was your question, you were waiting so patiently, thank you. <laughs> Did you was your question answered? It, actually, it wasn't, but I'm aware of time and I didn't want to be rude. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Maybe share it in the chat. Um, and maybe what we'll do now is we'll go to Zolma, uh, if, if you're ready, Zolma, to reflect back to us what you've heard. I like that thing, if you're ready. <laughs> like, what if I'm not ready? Like, what would happen if I say I'm not ready? <laughs> Doesn't it, like, I have to be ready, don't I? Um, I am... Um, um, as ready as I can be at this point, um, because it's a process uh, of, that's evolving with these um, drawings and listening. So uh, let's see if I can take you over to um, to my to my listening. Um, So it was a lot, <laughs> it was a lot to process. And, uh, and I've been trying to, to organize it here in a way that, um, that we can look at the whole um, in one image. I think that this is one of the beauties of, of graphic recording as opposed to a PowerPoint presentation where you have one concept and then you click next and then that concept is gone. Uh, and so this is kind of the, the, the beauty of integrating or trying to <laughs> integrate some of these key ideas um, so that we can uh, look at them as a whole. Um, and I was very, I was, I was quite, uh, it was quite useful for me um, to, to have this clear explanation of the why, kind of these three points. I was like, oh, wow, wonderful. That's why. Uh, and uh, how they went to, okay, so the 21st century reality, what's happening with power hierarchy and how those structures um, are, are being 
um, imposed or we continue to use them um, into our organizational structures. And really kind of that question of, wow, we're try trying to deal with other social issues, with social issues of today, with structures and, and legal concepts from way back um, that perhaps don't um, serve us the way we need them to. Um, so, so that was kind of that, oh, that this was useful for me. I needed to understand M most of these things when you're doing graphic recording is really um, you're like, what, what I need to understand, it's what ends up on the paper. And I kind of cross my fingers that it was related to what other people also needed to understand. Um, so I keep hoping that that's the way it works. And um, kind of above that why, like if this is, this is kind of the three, the, 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 what's um, sustaining the why, kind of giving ground to the why, kind of at the, Emerging from the why, I guess, is that um, is that beautiful um, invitation or sentence provocation of um, so that we can thrive in service of purpose. That's that's really the why, and and I wanted to emphasize here the we in and, and the diversity. And I thought it was very, very there was a very interesting question because it was a uh, also an invitation of starting from self and self development. Um, in this section over here, I had a bit of, of the, the comments that I heard from participants um, of their own understanding, understanding of self-organizing. Um, and um, there was this concept of sustainability, collaboration, and, and the, the tension, um, and I resonated with that a lot, um, if starting from self is really the way, or if it, that is the way for, for everyone, or if that's the language that will um, engage um, people. And this is when, perhaps when we're talking about um, first, first Nation people, Indigenous communities, other, other communities where perhaps the individual is not um, at the center. Um, so I wanted to give space to, to that as well. Um, and the, the reminder um, that um, we find it challenging uh, and um, difficult to deal with because we would like to know what's gonna happen and who's doing what. And like the, we're used to, to those structures that we have been institutionalized into, uh, but kind of that, hey, but it's actually the evolutionary principle of the universe. Like this is actually how life works. Um, and so it's a it's a beautiful way of breathing into uh, into our um, nature <laughs> uh, and kind of it allows ourselves, I guess, to I think for me to to navigate it with more um, compassion and ease. Um, and there's a few other concepts that will be included in the in the image. Um, at a later stage. And I um, will offer, I will send this image, this recording to Jen. And, um, and I hope um, I do this listening and this drawing work um, with the um, humble ambition <laughs> that it will um, support people's uh, learning and connection with the mind and the heart. And that will help us, all of us to continue the conversation and the exploration. Um, so that's, that'll be it. Jen, back to you. Really beautiful work, Soma. Thank you so much for sharing this and helping us with the integration of the learning. I'm so conscious of the time. It's always so hard to, to keep to schedule when, when we're in such rich learning and dialogue with each other. Um, but as we close, I just wanted to, um, uh, say that we will send a follow-up email to everybody who is registered. It will include uh, this recording. It will include the PowerPoint and Zulma's uh, graphic harvest. It will include uh, many of the links um, that have been shared in the chat. Um, we are starting a three session deep dive uh, to go more fulsomely into the learning together 
Um, and it starts next Thursday and it runs for three Thursdays from nine to 11. Um, we will again be recording those sessions. So um, if you are not able to attend all three, you can still participate through the, through the recording. Um, and you can register on our website through the events um, menu. And finally, I just want to say thank you so much to Christiana and Heather and Marnie um, for sharing their wisdom um, and, and their stories and um, the transparency of this learning journey. And thank you to all of you as well for agreeing to be here and to share in this part of the learning journey with all of us. And with that, we release you into whatever part of your day you are in, in this globe, and uh, we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thanks, bye-bye. Delightful Thank to be with you.